Welcome to another episode of Half Shirts Will Travel with Wendell. Today I'm bringing a Vesper Martini, uh, probably one of the least understood and most badass of all martinis. Comes from the James Bond novels. Now in the movies, you'll see James Bond will enter the screen, he'll be in a casino or a bar, or some high-end place, and he'll order a vodka martini shaken, not stirred. Big mistake. First of all, as we know how I feel about vodka, I can only say vodka to any drink is sort of like grain alcohol to Kool-Aid. It, you're really just drinking it for the, uh, the cherry or the raspberry or the grapefruit flavor. You want a buzz, you don't want to taste the alcohol. And that's why I think most people go with vodka. You're missing out on so much. Gin offers botanicals. Of course, it's based on the juniper and it brings all these sort of different flavors to combine to that. It, it's on your palate, you can get uh, good things going on. As it goes towards the back of your tongue, you'll taste the different things happening. Sometimes you get a little burr, a little bite. Sometimes you get a sweetness on the tip. Uh, a lot of texture, a lot of flavors going on with gin. The original martini was based on gin. It was a gin martini, and back in the day, it was 50% gin, 50% dry vermouth. Now, modern days, another problem, just like vodka, People are terrified of vermouth. Why, I have no idea. But the vermouth really opens up the gin. I don't use a 50-50 mix. I prefer a 3-1. Three, three parts gin, one part vermouth. And most importantly, we don't shake it. We stir it. Stirring the gin opens up the flavors. It gives you a nice bouquet. Whenever you're shaking it over ice, what you're really doing is bruising the gin. You're sort of beating down the flavors, muddling it up a little bit, and, uh, and you're losing some, some things the gin has to offer. So again, if you always want to stir your martini, don't shake it. That being said, Vesper Martini breaks all of my rules. So today, we're going to make a Vesper Martini. But first, let me tell you a little bit about this shirt I'm wearing. This is from one of my favorite shirt companies, Kamehameha. They've been around since 1936. They have traditional patterns. As the years go on, they have recreated patterns from the past. And this particular pattern is just called Rainbow Isle, for reasons that should be obvious when you look at the shirt. The, it was originally designed by a young woman uh, as, for an art piece, some sort of a presentation. It's on the Kamehameha website, you can read about it. They took this pattern she created and they turned it into a shirt. Now, why is this a high-end desirable shirt? Well, it's got all of those things I look for. It's got a pattern that wraps around crossing the placket. Very difficult to do. Most Hawaiian shirts, even the good ones, will generally not have that feature. It just takes too much fabric to create something like that. On top of it, it's got the vanishing shirt pocket, sewn in such a way that you should not be able to see it. It lines up with the pattern on the shirt. Features wooden buttons. And one of those things that I really like, it comes with a little collar. This goes around the top button, like so. You don't wear your shirt like this. If you do, you have to reevaluate. The reason you do this is when you're hanging it on a hanger, it gives your shirt a much better drape on the hanger. It'll hang more properly that way. It doesn't stretch it out as much. Also, I highly recommend using wooden coat hangers. Don't use wire ones. The wire ones, as time goes on, they're hanging on your shelf. They'll create a seam. What that seam is really doing is breaking the fabric. It's bending and pinching it over time. You're actually breaking the fabric. Whereas a smooth wooden coat hanger will protect the shirt from that. So that combination with this little button tab really will keep your shirt lasting a long time and looking good. As I said, we've got the wraparound pattern depicting, I believe that's diamond head. Goes all the way around. High quality, it's a silk, uh, highly recommend it. Again, Kamehameha, one of my favorite shirt manufacturers. They're still in business since 1936. Look them up sometime. Now about this drink, as I've said, normally you don't want to shake your martini. You want to stir it. You want to open up the gin, get that bouquet going, as opposed to muddling it or mashing it or bruising it with the uh, brutalizing it in the ice shaker. Most bars you go to, you order a martini, they're going to whip out that shaker and just start shaking like there's no tomorrow. There's probably two reasons. One, the bartender didn't know any better, or more importantly, the bartender assumes you don't know any better. So 
Be smart. Request your martini stirred, not shaken. Unless you want a Vesper martini. Ian Fleming designed this drink for his character James Bond. And as I said, over the years in the movies, they sort of changed it. But this is how it really is supposed to be built. First thing you're going to do is you're going to start with the cocktail shaker. Now, one thing I said you never use, I prefer a Boston shaker. It comes with a little cup and a larger one, or you can get a 16-ounce uh, glass to fit in. Either one of those works really well. Take that shaker. Now, another uh, rule breaker here is, you know I'm fond of those large, clear ice cubes. Okay, on this one, I've just got my regular ice cubes. Uh, they're pure, it was purified water, but you know, it doesn't give you the same clarity because it takes special freezing technique to get the clarity you need. In this particular case, we're not worried about that. I'll tell you why. We've got a lot of things going on here. So, we're gonna to need to shake that and get those slivers of ice going in that martini. We're gonna start three parts gin. I'm gonna do an ounce and a half per part. One, two, and three. Now, here comes the crazy part. We're gonna have one part vodka. Again, ounce and a half is my measurement. So, three parts gin, one part vodka. But wait, there's more. Traditionally, you want to use a dry vermouth in your martini. This is your magic ingredient. We're substituting the dry vermouth with a Lille Blanc. With that, we're going to do a half part, so or three quarters of an ounce. Three quarters of an ounce Lille Blanc. One and a half ounce vodka, four and a half ounces of gin. If you've got a nice dry London drink, London gin, like a beef eater, that'll be fantastic. I don't have any of that on hand. Um, any London dry is a good choice. So, we've now combined it in the ice. And again, we don't have that hard, clear ice that doesn't break down. We've just got traditional ice cubes that everybody has in the refrigerator. These have a tendency to break down and melt quickly. They fracture, they crack, and that's actually desirable. So, we're going to shake this thing so we can break up that ice really good. All right, so ideally, you want that cocktail shaker to stick to your hand, it's so cold. And we're just about there. All right, now, last but not least, there was a time when I used to say that if you're going to drink a martini, not only should it be gin, you want either an olive or an onion. Now, a uh, cocktail onion is known as Gibson Martini, and those are fantastic. I love those. Um, cocktail, uh, an olive, of course, is very traditional. It's a great look to a clear liquid. But on top of that, if you're gonna have a dirty gin martini, which is a different thing, then you really gotta garnish with the olive. This martini breaks all the rules. So you want that lemon twist. The lemon twist will help bring out the citrus. I like to rub the inside of the glass. Ian Fleming didn't say to do that, but again, I want to get that citrus oil on the inside of the glass and help with the flavor. You drop a big chunk of lemon peel in. This thoroughly shaken martini, we pour it. And this is our Vesper martini. See, there's a slight discoloration that comes from the Lille Blanc. It adds a little bit of color. The lemon peel also accentuates the color as well. Now, yeah, that's good. Again, I love this drink because I like anything that breaks the rules, even if they're my own rules. Now, when is it appropriate to drink a Vesper Martini? For that matter, when is it appropriate to wear this shirt? 
Well, I'll tell you. Let's just say you've been invited to the family get together and all your in-laws are gonna be there. They're already passing judgment on you. You don't stand a chance. So what you wanna do is make a grand entrance. This is the shirt to do it in. This is an unparalleled level of badassery. No one has a shirt like this. When you walk in, it's a jaw dropper. People are literally gonna stop back, roll their eyes, say, what was he thinking? You don't care because that's your statement. You're wearing this for yourself, not for them. However, if you go in and you're drinking some blue cocktail with lemon wedges and orange wheels and fruity things floating around some umbrellas, and you're wearing this shirt, you kind of look like a buffoon. So how you want to catch everybody off guard is you're wearing the shirt, but then you're drinking a Vesper Martini. And when people ask what it is and you tell them, they'll be very afraid. And that's your goal. Let them know you don't care, but that clear drink commands respect and it doesn't detract from the cool shirt. You don't want to drink something that matches your shirt. Always a bad call. I hope this has been helpful today. I hope you enjoy your Vesper Martinis. Look up Kamehameha. Again, I get nothing from this for uh, promoting them, but it happens to be one of my favorite shirt companies. So this was another episode of Half Shirts Will Travel with Wendell. Thank you and cheers. If you want more of my thoughts and insights on Aloha shirts, cocktails, gear, tools, or anything else I may think of, please like and subscribe. See you in the next episode of Half Shirts Will Travel.